Good morning. Coach Bear Bryant said that the road, the problem with the road to success is that's got a lot of parking spots. And what we've done here over the past two or three weeks now is we've given you the opportunity to take a parking spot. The unfortunate reality is, is that we haven't achieved or arrived or gained victory or success or anything. But we've given you some parking spots and some people have chose to park their car in those parking spots and unfortunately have missed or are missing the greatest gold or the greatest victory. A few weeks ago now we talked about the importance of hearing the Word of God. We offered you a parking spot. Our success, our, our goal, our victory, our, our ultimate destination is salvation. And anything short of that is loss. It's doom. It's separation. And unfortunately, this morning, a lot of people have heard the Word of God and they have taken their parking spot as far as they want to go. They've traveled the road as long as they want to travel and now their car sits idly in the parking spot. A few weeks ago now we talked about the importance of believing without faith it is impossible. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe will be damned or condemned. There's your parking spot. Far too many souls have pulled in and put the car in an idle, neutral, parked position. The goal, the victory, the success, the, the destination on the road is salvation. And we're not there yet. And yet so many people have chosen to take the first two parking spots. Last week we, we talked about the importance of repentance. There's some things in your life, though you may be a very good person, and there's a lot of good people in the world, those that are outside of Christ and don't enjoy the salvation that only comes in Christ, they need to make some changes, be it as good as they are. They need to change some things in their lives. And first and foremost, they need to achieve salvation. They need to reach the destination. But they've chose to choose the parking spot of, well, I'll make a few changes. Yeah, this probably wasn't good, and that probably wasn't good, and so I'll, I'll adjust this or that. But I'm just going to park right here in, in this parking spot of repentance. I've heard the Word. I, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I, yeah, I'll make a few changes. Now, I'm not sure I'll make all the changes that God wants me to make, but I'll, I'll just pull off right here in this parking spot and with it I'll be content. With it, you'll also be lost and doomed and separated from God. This morning, I want to offer you another parking spot. Now, it is the case that when, when most people get to their mindset of this point, that, that they're willing now to go all the way to the destination. And so parking spots are not near as attractive by this point. In other words, we've traveled up the road. You know, I don't know why. I don't know why they, they put benches along the road hiking up to Clingman's Dome. You know, when you get out of the car, you know that is a mile and three-tenths, and it's going to be all uphill. After all, you're going to the highest place in the Smoky Mountains, Okay. You know it's going to be a climb, so before you ever start, there's going to be a climb there. Why put benches? And you know the bench that makes the least sense to me, the last one? The last one? Because it's in view of Clingman's Dome. 
I mean, you can see it for crying out loud. Why would you sit down on that bench to rest? It's right there. I mean, just go on. Of course, if you've ever been up there, you know when you get to it, you still got to hike on about a 75 degree angle, it feels like, to get up to the, to the top of the top, right? In that little tower thing that's up there. The bench is, the parking spot's right there. But the parking spot is so close to the ultimate goal, I just can't see that parking spot being near as attractive as the one halfway down the trail. But I'll offer you another parking spot. It's the parking spot of confession. When you get to the point to where you say, I truly believe... And now I want this belief to do something for my life. This is where we are. When I get to the point on the road where I say, I have heard what God wants me to do. I believe that this is the right thing to do. I need to make some changes. and I, I, my, my greatest change is that I need to be in Christ. And, and then I've got to make some some. Some relationship changes and some, some, I've got to alter some lifestyle choices, but I, I can do that with God's help. Now I am, and oftentimes what people think is now I'm ready to go up before the church and I'm ready to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Far too many people feel like. That's what confession is only. And let me challenge you this morning. If, if your belief in confessing Christ is what you did and only what you did, for those of you that are New Testament Christians, before you were baptized, you chose the parking spot. And your car sets idle. Because when I understand fully what the Bible suggests with confession. It's about being honest and a real lifestyle of living. Now if the Lord's will, in a couple of weeks, we'll get on to this idea of faithful living, but, but i got to be honest with you, it really starts right here for me. As Martin W. Stone would go, hear, believe, repent, and confess. What are we confessing? What does confession look like? How is it lived out in, well, how is it lived out in the moments of suffering when we find out who we really are? I'm asking you to be honest with yourself. I want to know what does your life look like? The ultimate goal is salvation. And to get there, did you hear the Bible reading in Five Talent this morning? From 1 John that Eli Turner read from 1 John chapter 1. If we walk in the lie, that is confession, 1 John 1 and verse 7. It's behavior, it's lifestyle, it's who we are. It's more than just standing before an audience and saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's about now taking that belief and moving down the road toward a lifestyle of faithfulness to God. When you look in the book of Job, the word is really only found one time, and it's not even found one time in the English Standard Version, it's in Job 40, and it's in verse 14. And it's God speaking here, and God says to Job, Then I will, and if you're reading King James, New King James, Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. English Standard Version translates it acknowledge. What's the point? The point is in this context of this verse, God is saying to Job, Okay, Job, can you do this? Can you do that? Job, where were you when the wall was formed? Job, who brought the trees up out of the ground? Job, who pushed the water down so that the ocean would have deep, deep parts in it? Job, who reached down and picked up the dirt and raised up mountains like the one that Clingman Dome sits on? 
Who did all that? Job, was you there? Can you do that? Would you just reach down and pick up a little dirt for me? See if a, see if a 10,000 foot mountain will rise out of it. Would you try that for me? I tell you what, if you can do that, you see, this is kind of the conclusion to this whole challenge, if you will. If you can do that, then I will confess. God says, then I'll confess. Hey, if you need salvation, your own right hand can do it. Obviously, it's rhetorical. Obviously, it's, it's not possible. Obviously, Job is sitting there going, well, no, God, I wasn't there. Well, no, God, I can't. Well, no, God, that's not possible. Well, no, God, that's, that's not within my power. Okay, then. Neither is it in your power for your right hand to save you. Salvation must come from elsewhere. But God says, if you can prove this to me, I'll confess. I'll acknowledge. I'll make it known to all. Thus, our idea of the word from the Hebrew word to make known to all. Thus why before a baptism occurs, we say to the individual who has responded to the gospel, do you believe that Jesus Christ... It is an acknowledgement to all that I am receiving through obedient faith the salvation that God has offered through His Son who died on the cross for my sins. And now I'm going to... Now I'm going to go on and live... We, we don't like these two words in the church, but let me tell you, they're biblical words, you understand? We, we, we're kind of we're fearful of the words witness and testify. Now let me tell you something. Your Bible uses the words witness and testify. And while the religious world may abuse the two terms, let's not allow them to take it out of our vocabulary. Because if we're not careful, if we lose sight of what the meaning of it is, the biblical meaning to be a witness for Christ or to testify that I am a New Testament Christian, I think we've lost the meaning of confession. Because then it only becomes a public acknowledgement once and upon a time and whoever was there at that moment in time and the reality of it might be is that it was at midnight on a Tuesday night and there was only a half a dozen people there and they were your family. And maybe one of the elders. And that's the only people that heard you make that once upon a time confession at that given moment before the occasion of your baptism. And if that's the only people that ever hear that from your life, you've taken my parking spot. You put your car in idle. You've parked it. Because when I study the Bible on confession... These two words right here, witness and testify, speak to a lifestyle that says, I am living before you. You see, if you were to ask me to define confession, you ready? Here it is, write it down. I may never think of it again, so write it down so you can remind me how I define confession. I'm just kidding. Ask me to define confession. Here it is. It is a public reveal of an inner real. It is a public reveal. We have all these reveals today, right? Gender reveal parties. We have these people revealing their new identity. Let me tell you what reveal you need to be. You need to be revealing something that is real inside of you that's called Christianity. Confession. A public reveal of an inner real. It is real to you. It is real to your life. It is real in your heart. And it comes out and it's revealed to those who are around you. Job chapter 16 and verse 8. Job says, He has shriveled me up, which is a witness against me. And my leanness has risen up against me. It testifies to my face. Verse 19, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. And he who testifies for me is on high. 
You see the word confess only occurs that one time. But the idea of witness or to testify has several different occasions in the book. Eliphaz uses the word to testify. He says, your own mouth condemns you. Not I. Job 15 and verse 6. Your own lips testify against you. Eliphaz says, Job, I, I'm, I'm not making the accusation here. You're my, your lips are telling the truth here. Your lips are revealing what is inside of you. And oh, how true. I realize Job 15 and verse 6 was said in a context, in a paragraph, and I don't want to misuse Scripture and just pull a Scripture out, but oh, how true it is today that our lips can testify against us. Because what your life is saying to people around you is a whole lot more powerful than what's coming out of your mouth. And my friends, if I could suggest to you what I believe confession is, that is confession. Our life, our behavior, who we are. And that our lips coincide with and testify to what is real on the inside that we are claiming to be and be a part of. And it becomes real. And it becomes revealed what is real. Perhaps you think, when you think about confession, someone has defined it as the fruit of repentance. One who is repenting is now confessing, and, and the fruit that comes from that repentance is a new lifestyle, a new behavior, a willingness to admit and to adhere and to publicly announce a belief in Christ that is changing a life in Christ, that is changing behaviors, and so thus they define it as the fruit of repentance. If we were to go through the plan of salvation and we were to try to give scriptures to go with each part of God's plan or the steps in God's plan, we would give scriptures on confession like Matthew 10, verse 32 and verse 33, where Jesus says to those He's about to send out, He says, guys, don't be afraid. Don't, don't fear, don't, don't, don't be scared. I'm, I'm sending you out into a bunch of wolves. Why wouldn't you be scared? Right? But I don't want you to be scared. The, this, there is power in this work. Let me tell you where the power comes from. If you confess my Father before men, if you confess me before men, if you confess us, if you live and teach and proclaim with your lips our message, the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'll go before my Father and I'll say, yep, that is, I will publicly acknowledge you before the Father because I know it is real inside of you. But now be advised. Be advised, guys, that if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before God. Maybe one of the worst things that could ever happen to your soul is to go in on Judgment Day and for Jesus to say, Father, He's not one of us. He doesn't belong here. He's not part of our family. The other passage that might come to mind, same chapter, different book, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth, this is what David Butler read a moment ago, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you, are, that you confess and are saved. Paul, writing to a group of saints at Rome here, a group of Christians 
And he's teaching them about the importance of the Word of God and the surety that one has as a child of God. Romans chapter 10. And he's saying there's power in the Word. There's hope in the Word. There is joy in Christian living. Now here's how you go out and live it. You go out and confess to others that you belong to me. That you belong to Christ, rather. Paul writing. That you belong to Christ. And it's so confessing in your heart and in so believing in your heart. You see, it's an inner real. It is real on the inside and then it comes out on the outside. It is publicly revealed so that others around you know what is in your heart. They know what's real deep down inside of you by your behavior, by your lifestyle, by your lips. Paul says to a group of Christians now, you need to confess with your mouth in order that salvation might be yours. And those would be, those would be our two most common passages. When you look in the book of Acts, you know, you always want to, you always want to go, I'll come back. You always want to go to the book of Acts, right? Always want to go to the book of Acts and find an example. Well, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, and I realize that you will find some manuscript difficulties here, and if you want to talk more about that, I'll talk more about it with you privately. But in Acts chapter 37, if in fact this verse does belong and is in your Bible and does take place. Here's what Philip said to the eunuch in the chariot. If you believe with all your heart, you may. See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And this is the only example that we have if we allow verse 37 to be in there. After the eunuch says, what hinders me from being baptized, Philip says, if you believe in all your heart, you may. And the eunuch replies, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And verse 38, both he and Philip went down into the water, and both he and Philip came up out of the water. And if it is the case that verse 37 fits, thus we have developed our practices based on verse 37 of Acts chapter 8, and there it is. The eunuch wanted to be baptized. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart. And what confession did the eunuch make? He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And thus he was baptized based on that belief by, by Philip. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, Saul is on the road to Damascus and Saul says, Are you the Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And the text goes on where Saul accepts Jesus and and he's ended up, he's blinded and doesn't eat and he goes on into Damascus and he's taught the gospel and he accepts Jesus who, whom he is persecuting. Are you the Lord? Saul asks. Is it you, Lord? He says, yes, it is I. Thus a confession is made on the road to Damascus in some roundabout way. As I back up and I think about the importance of James chapter 1, James says, be doers of the Word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer and not a doer, he's like a man that looks into a mirror and when he walks away, he forgets what he's looking at. James 4 and verse 17, whoever knows to do good and does not, to him it is, to him it is sin. Confession is about doing, being a doer of good. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 9, if you're going to run a race, run it well. There's only one going to get the prize. So if you're going to run, get in the race and run for success. 
Run to be victorious. Run to achieve the wreath. It is a perishable wreath. But let me tell you something. In the race of life, we're running for an imperishable one. Run well. Give it your all. Do your best. That is confession. Confession. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And because I believe that, I'm going to run well. I'm going to do my best. Not just hear the Word and take a parking spot, but be a doer of the Word. Be active. Seeing opportunity to do good and taking that opportunity. For if I don't, I realize that it is sin. Peter had a chance, didn't he? Peter had a chance in Matthew 16. Who do men say that I am? Peter, oh me, what a confession, right? Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, Peter hit it right on the head, didn't he? Peter got it right. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But then I close with this one this morning. Found in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven, those who are in earth, and those who are under the earth. And every tongue will confess. It's a simple question for me. It's not if, it's when. It's not if, it's when. Because as I shared many times throughout this summer in the Wednesday night of my gospel meeting series for 2017. On Wednesday night, I asked the question over and over this summer. When, when will you confess the name of Jesus? It's not if you will. Because Philippians 2 makes it very clear that we all will. Every tongue. That includes yours. Every tongue will confess. The question is when. When will you and I accept the reality that there is not an hour of our life that goes by that we don't need Jesus Christ? When will you and I embrace the fact that every hour of our life that we live, we must live it in Christ, living for Christ, living by the power of Christ, professing the name of Christ, and helping others to see the light of Christ? When? When will we confess that? Some people will wait till it's too late. Don't be one of them. Acknowledge today that you need Jesus every hour of every day. And if you don't have Him, we want you to, we want you to have Him. We want to help you be in Christ. This is not a parking spot. This is an end till we meet again on the ultimate journey of salvation that will culminate in receiving that salvation through being immersed into water baptism. Would you let your soul have that opportunity today? Or are you going to take a parking spot? I need... Jesus, every hour. And so do you. So if you don't have Him, would you come right now so we stand and sing?